Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. We're doing a real talk with Vantage Ventures and Rodney Williams. Um, if you haven't joined us for a real talk before, Vantage is an amplifier of scalable startups here in West Virginia, and we use real, this real talk series to chat with some exceptional individuals about their why and also how they got to be where they are. We're obsessed with entrepreneurs and we spend a lot of time learning about what drives them and how their unique stories have built them to succeed. And today we have the total honor of talking with Rodney Williams. Um, Rodney, you've been listed on like countless platforms as one as a few one of the superstars to watch. You have two amazing startups like totally blooming and of course you're a WVU alum as well and so welcome we're super excited to have you and just appreciate you taking the time today definitely uh, thank you for having me yeah absolutely um out of that long list I was totally like overwhelmed by all the people who have named you like you know top entrepreneur to watch and all of these amazing um, moments do you have any one that felt like the proudest so far? Um, you know, I think uh, <laughs> uh, that's probably the, the, the one thing that I probably haven't necessarily done, but I think it's a good thing is that I don't necessarily think I've like um, uh, technically appreciated a lot of those things. I think those things are um, fantastic and great, but I think, um, I think my ambition is a, is a little bit more extended from the award. I mean, the accolades are fantastic, and it's great to be recognized amongst your peers. Um, but, it, you know, I, I'm, I like to think that I'm, like, still in the trenches. trenches. I'm still building a company. Um, I'm still um, challenged by the, the by the many things that I have to, to deal with. So th those are pretty the things that I, I think about the most. Yeah, awesome. That's amazing. Um, and so I really want to hear about both listener and solo funds. Um, it's They're both really exciting and um, have a, a ton of future applications plus what they're already doing. Um, but if if you don't mind like taking us back a couple steps to talk about where you're from and kind of how you ended up where you are today, that would be awesome. Definitely. So, uh, and you can obviously bear with me, it's the middle of the day. So if you hear a notification, I'm slowly turning that off. Um, but you know, my, my background and where everything all started for me um, was roughly, um, honestly, post um, at my time in WU. So I'm originally from Baltimore. I came to WU, thought I was going to be an athlete um, and play sports, uh, football and track. That that quickly changed by my sophomore year. I um, I was a double undergrad, so I did a... Um, my finance degree was out of the business school and my economics degree was out of Eberly Arts and Science. Um, I, um, I then, um, I, 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 in school, I started many things. Um, I had a business in, in undergrad as well that did well. Um, when I graduated college or undergrad, I went to work at Lockheed Martin um, in government. I, um, I actually had a government intern at the National Energy Technology Laboratory in Morgantown, West Virginia. I don't even know if it's still there, but it's uh, it's in the back world somewhere. <laughs> uh, I did that. And um, honestly, that's where I, when I got my chops in technology and when I started to be obsessed with technology. Um, to be honest, um, it was where I was working in the government. Um, and, and then fast forward, eventually I, I made my way into marketing. Um, I made my way into uh, integrated marketing communications degree. Um, master's out of Everly Arts and Science. I completed that, um, then went to Washington, D.C. to do my MBA at Howard University. At this time, I'm 24 years old, and I launched my career at Procter & Gamble. Um, so at Procter & Gamble, I was a brand manager, or I made my way to a brand manager, but at the time, I, I was... Um, I, I led a lot of the digital things that the company um, coined today. I was I launched the first uh, brand on social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, the first mobile app. You know, I wrote I was the first marketer wrote digital patent um, at Procter and Gamble. But that got me to my first company, which became Listener. Um, at some point in 2012, I had the idea, uh, and then 
um, I, I broke away from Procter & Gamble to start my first company. Um, the, the simple way I can say, listener, um, think of it as an alternative to Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi in some instance, where we've created a alternative way to send and receive information from two devices. Now, what's the, the innovation is that we're actually leveraging software and, and sound that you can't hear. So we use ultrasonic audio as a method to send and receive information. Now, fast forward to today, that company is, uh, you know, has raised uh, about $40 million today, have investors like Visa, um, Synchrony Financial, and even Target. But where the market is leveraging the technology is to actually drive mobile payments. And when you actually pay using your mobile device in a retail environment or an environment where you're leveraging the Target app or the retailer's app, our technology is being used to make that transaction more secure. Um, it's actually sending and receiving a signal that makes sure that the person that is supposed to be present making that transaction is actually present. So the tagline for a listener is actually person present proven. It happens behind the scene, pretty quiet, pretty seamlessly. Um, so obviously about three, maybe four years ago, um, alongside one of my best friends, we decided to just think about another company. And we didn't start with thinking about another company. We actually just thought it, we started with just, we had a problem with, with our family. And I would go home and I would wonder why all my friends and family always wanted to borrow money. And it would be $50 to go out, it would be $100, you know. And when we did our research, it's actually a huge amount of Americans that live check to check. And, and, and when they need capital or they need small funds or emergency funds, they tend to resort to like payday loans or really bad decisions or even um, friends and family. And what we wanted to create is an easier way for people to gain access to funds. And we wanted a way for people to make better decisions when lending funds. And that was the birth of Solo. I can talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, I just did, you were doing like such an awesome role of, of everything that has kind of come to today. Yeah. Um, but, and I definitely, there's a, there's a few things that you mentioned that I would love to hear like a little more about. Um, and so I think if, if we go kind of back, I was, you know, when you mentioned that you were out of school, you had a good number of, of degrees under your belt and a lot of amazing education, and then decided to take a job with P&G, which is kind of this you know, you see it as this like corporate behemoth, but you got a job in innovation there. I guess what was your thinking going with a job at PNG and then how you springboarded from there to kind of have the confidence to go on your own? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me, it was, it was pretty much the same confidence, you know, and I think, I think, it's super important too. I think my confidence is independent of the ability that I still need to learn. Um, um, and usually that that's not there or present, but I think that's really, really important note for, for anyone that's listening or watching. It, you should, you should be confident that you can figure something out, but that means you're confident that you can learn it if you don't know it, not that you know it. And I think that's, the like my core confidence i'm not really confident that i know anything better than anyone else <laughs> uh, the only thing i'm confident is that i'm going to figure it out and i'm probably going to learn it um and when i do learn it i'm probably going to be better at it than most um yeah. and so that's 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 all i have really so and you know for me you know you know going to work was it was it was all about that, right? You know, it was a huge organization that was respected. I mean, they, they invented the concept of brand management. Um, I felt like it was a learning environment that I could not um, that would be incredible for me. And I look and, and I look at everything as a learning environment that's going to be incredible for me. So um, that's kind of how I looked at it. And honestly, what what I what I learned there and how I was able to learn there, um, it only it only accelerated 
everything that I did outside of the corporate environment. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally understandable. And and then, so you kind of, you go from there and, you know, I'm sure, yeah, it sounds like you were learning some of the things you needed to then go on to make Listener a success. Um, and just to make sure we've kind of got a, I've got this idea right. So the, it's, oh, sorry about that. Um, it's, it's allowing like the, like if I'm paying with a pay, a payment on my phone at the cashier, it's ensuring that it's, you know, I'm the one actually holding my phone to use that card that's in the phone. Is that? Yeah, so to so, so set simply and even simplify, think of anywhere today where you're in a retailer and you're, the retailer may ask you to scan a QR code, right? Um, that tends to be like buy online, pick up store. If anyone has done curbside pickup, if anyone has done self checkout or scan and go, these are all methods that have actually become pretty popular post COVID as people don't want to necessarily be in close contact with other people. Now, to do a lot of those interactions, there requires a level of authentication. And what I mean by that is, is that the merchant needs to make sure that you received goods or the service that you have paid for. And when when you need distance, you know, taking out your credit card, swiping things isn't an option necessarily. Getting really, really close isn't an option. So, um, you know, the user doesn't necessarily see anything. You open up an app, you click pay, and it says, thank you, you, you can leave. Well, what's happening is that our signal is communicating with that attendant or counter. We actually can not only measure distance, so we can understand how far you are actually away or your actual device is from that terminal. We can pass information. We can pass that, you know, you clicked pay from this phone, IP address, phone number, et cetera, at that particular time and that particular location to that terminal. Um, so in the event you would say, I didn't receive those goods, they actually had a digital record, a digital, non-human, human, non, uh, independent of human error way of acknowledging that, no, that consumer was present when those services were distributed. So things are like that. I think when you get into payments, I know sometimes we think about like the simplest way of like, I just pay, right? But in the entire payment commerce experience, you have when you authorize the pay, when the receipt, when you actually pay, when services are received. Um, and then there's all types of legal logic that protect the consumer, just in case you have an issue with those services or goods are received. And in that entire ecosystem, there's data points that are required. And I guess what I'm getting at is these new commerce experience like scan and go and buy online pickup, they didn't necessarily have good authentication. That scanning of the QR code wasn't necessarily as secure as what would be required um, historically. Wow, that feels like made for our for the current situation of people, I mean, curbside pickup has flipped and, you know, all of these different methods of, of needing to validate purchases. It feels like just an absolute time where that technology is needed. It's an absolute time. Everyone here, trust me, if you receive a service that good, you get a food delivery and you didn't scan anything, just call in and say, I didn't get it. (laughs) (laughs) That helps us. (laughs) Um, but again, that's, 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 the, that's the problem, because technically, from a legal standpoint, if there was no validation that you received the goods, technically, if you went to your bank or you went to anyone and said that I didn't receive the goods, they couldn't argue that you didn't. They would have to refund you money. And that is the problem. So I know we think, oh, my God, contact this is amazing. Just leave it at the door or I'm going to pick it up, you know, throw it in the trunk. I'm going to go to this kiosk and there's going to be like five different bags. I'm just going to pick the bag up with my name. All of these things are potential fraud concerns um, that we will fix. Ah, yeah. And so that seems hugely applicable right now. As, as you like look forward for a listener, are there 
any other areas you really see high potential or you kind of could could see more applications as the company grows? I mean, that's that's that's, that's the problem, listener, or the challenge is that we can do a lot of things. And sometimes a lot of things is distracting and you got to focus. So um, with that said, I think our core focus is definitely retail. I, I mentioned things like food delivery. We call that mobility. So mobility is also an important for us, you know, ticketing, transportation. Um, these are also areas where you need to validate that you're there and that you received the ride or received the, the ticket. So these are particular areas where we're also um, where that, that has the highest, what I'll call opportunity for us, a market opportunity for us. Um, there's other things that we do. Um, we're in cars, we're in, um, we're in cars, we're in conference room solutions, we're in all types of technology that you may or may not know. And, and they're not necessarily a focus for us, but they, they, they definitely, um, assist in paying the bills. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, as you have, you're rolling with listener and there's all these applications out there that you're juggling and trying to keep like focused on, you know, what, where you all want to focus, um, at this, you know, while this is happening, you hit the, you hit across this like need for some other way to get small amounts of money to people who need it, um, for various, you know, just month to month closing a small gap. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what solo funds, you know, you talked about kind of where it came from that you went home and someone was asking for like 50 bucks or a hundred bucks to until next month. But so what exactly is solo funds? Yeah. So where it came from, what, I mean, today it's, it's it's interesting because both companies today have have a, a much more heightened and more aggressive market opportunity due to the current climate. Yeah. I think that's vision. <laughs> <laughs> but Solo today, from a consumer standpoint, and I'll, I'll communicate it versus just like a consumer, if you're someone who needs immediate access to 50 to $500, you sign up within two minutes, you post to a marketplace, the Solo, it's a mobile app, it scores um, the lender or it scores the borrower um, based on that request. Let's just say I need $100. I post it to the marketplace. The marketplace is a two-sided marketplace. So there's borrowers and there's lenders. Lenders are actually individuals. These are not institutions. This is, you know, Mike um, from Cincinnati. He sees your $100 request. Um, you also select a tip in which you're gonna tip him. He sees how much you're gonna tip when you're gonna repay, and he actually chooses to lend you the capital. The platform automatically debits and credits and manages the repayment and manages all of the science and the security to ensure that that borrower would actually get his money almost immediately. Like within the next hour, he could actually receive those funds in his bank account. And and obviously, uh, the platform makes sure that on the repayment date that that money is then returned to the the, the lender. Um, so that is, is that is the consumer facing product. Um, what has changed though, and what's really really important, is that if if anyone has tried to get a loan lately, I, I hope that you we were all seen it as a little bit harder in this current climate, mainly mainly because credit restriction is happening. Basically, anytime there's a recession. That basically means there's a lot more people who can't pay their bills on time, so the credit market tightens up and capital becomes more expensive. So that means anyone who actually lends, it tends to be harder for them to lend because the capital is restrictive. Now, um, obviously that's not a problem for us because our capital market is an individuals who, who have capital. So that's really, really important. Um, the other aspect that's really important about the platform is that from a, from a, from a borrower standpoint, um, we don't risk, the way we risk assess or underwrite has nothing to do with your credit report. Um, we could almost, we could care less. We actually don't pull it at all. There's no approval process. Um, the way we assess uh, a borrower's ability to repay has everything to do or a lot to do with your cash flow. 
Um, basically, we're taking a look at the past 24 months and how capable were you to actually keep funds in your account or um, and it's different. Obviously, we know and I know that m people have multiple jobs. They could be an Uber driver one day. They could work at a pizza shop the next day. They could be a student for the majority of the year. So if you look at you can't necessarily just look at a historical snapshot like a credit report to assess if their ability to pay in the future. So that underwriting and that source of capital has made um, Solo an, an extremely, extremely, what I would call attractive tool to deploy capital moving forward. Um, and, and, and that's really in the, the behind of it. In the front of it, yes, it's a very, very nice and nifty mobile app that you can do all these cool features. Behind it, it's a very, very uh, powerful underwriting tool and a, a capital marketplace that is growing um, very, very rapidly. All right. And it's amazing. So, right, let's say, I mean, this is like, has to be broadening access to some of that, you know, it's these loans or some, you know, small amounts of funding. Cause right, it is, it's capped at a certain amount, right? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's technically 50 to $1,000, but most loans are 50 to 500. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. And so, um, even if, like, let's say it, it, we weren't in a credit straight, you know, tightened credit environment. Um, it, it's still, you know, would you, how does it compare with like people trying to get traditional credit scores up or getting access to like that hundred dollars in a more traditional, like pre solo world versus like their experience when solo is available using these really different ways of assessing risk and whether or not they'll, be able to pay that back. Yeah. So number one, right? 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So I think 46% of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency. So let's just focus on the data, right? Let's just say you have a $400 emergency. Um, maybe you blew a tire and you need a tire, or maybe something happened with your brakes, um, or maybe your air conditioner just went out, right? You can't go to your local bank and get a four hundred dollar loan. Okay, so if your credit card, if your credit card, if you don't have four hundred dollars on your credit card, if you have a credit card, you can't go to a bank and get a personal loan for four hundred dollars. What can you do? The only thing you really can do is go to a payday lender, where or a title lender, where you literally have to give them your car's title to get four hundred dollars to pay back in a couple of weeks, or a payday loan, which they basically have the right to, of your pay, to garnish your pay in some instance. Both of those options on average charge 400% um, interest rates. They're predatory, right? But that that is a $40 billion market in the market. So I know we think that like, oh, who needs, sometimes it's kind of challenging, like who needs these loans? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, a lot of people. Well, forty billion dollars worth of people. Um, then that's payday loans. If I look at subprime market, uh, and, and and subprime and prime, or you 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 can add a another hundred and fifty billion dollars of lending that happens in that market. And this is what you would call like I would call the majority of actually Americans are actually within. So, um, no, the, the the option is not even that it's a it's a good option. The option is this portion of America is who's preyed on is preyed on by certain institutions. So I, I would tell you that without Solo as an option, it would just be someone else uh, making a significant amount, I think making bad choices. All right, yeah, totally. And I guess, so to that point, you know, you mentioned briefly how you have kind of a totally different way of risk assessing. You know, you're not pooling people's credit scores. Um, can you talk a little more about that? Like kind of what, yeah, who who are some people? I mean, what's the example of, of someone that's coming to Solo and is kind of a, frankly, a great borrower? Like it's gonna, you know, getting risk assessed, like the risk is pretty low um, and how you all look at assessing that risk. So I guess that's two questions in one, kind of how you're thinking about risk and the data that becomes interesting and useful as you do that, as well as, Kind of what are you know what is like a tip i'm sure there's no one typical but an example of of someone who would be using solo funds as a borrower 
and a and a lender. Well, I mean, our average borrowers are. Um, we have a, a big chunk of borrowers that are like, um, we call them government employees, um, but they're social workers, they're teachers, they're, they're police officers, they're, they're government employees. There's a huge amount of government employees that basically make below $60,000, long story short. Um, and it's uh, sometimes seasonal. Um, there's a huge population of users that are students. Um, if you can imagine needing a textbook and not wanting to go home, um, students don't have credit cards uh, in today's environment. So when they have an emergency that they don't want to go to mom and dad about, they have to go to some somewhere else. Um, there is also a huge amount of users that are tend to be um, gig economy um, employees, so Uber and Postmates, et cetera. I, I think the last time we pulled the numbers, I think it was like 15% of our, of our borrowers had an, an advanced degree. 30% had a uh, bachelor's degree, um, um, which, you know, if you do the math, it's, you know, over 40% were educated. Um, and then I think the average salary is between thirty-five dollars to $56,000 um, as a borrower. Again, that, that is also surprising when we tell those stats because you would think it's something different, but it's actually not. Um, and then our lenders, and just to cut it, cause tell the flip side, we, we like to, the lenders um, have an average income of seventy-five to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The average lender is a white male um, that is about forty-one years old, um, and he's lending a lot of capital out of his checking account and, and savings account. So he is, this is not the funds that he would put in an investment vehicle. This is not the funds that he would necessarily put in a money market account. This is literally his operating capital. He gets paid on Thursday, he lends. And why he's doing that, it's really, really important. The loan, the duration of our loans are short. They're under 30 days. So if I'm a lender, this is a very, very liquid investment. I'm gonna get my money back within a couple days, a couple weeks, but not a couple months. So that's why a lot of our lenders are not lending their like investment account, they're lending their what's in their checking account, the excess in their checking account. So those are two components. Um, so, all right, this borrower comes in, um, we, you, you sign up, you connect your bank account. Um, obviously we follow all uh, KYC and AML requirements um, because we do work with alongside banks and money processors. Um, your social security, your ID. Um, we start to also pull your social media data. Um, we actually even pull carrier data. Um, basically, uh, think about um, you know a Verizon versus a Cricket wireless. And again, all of these we believe say something more accurate about that person's ability to repay. And and that's why we pull that data. And that data is actually more important to us. Than, than the credit score. And to be clear, I think we're, we, we are three times more better at predicting um, credit risk or default risk than the current credit score. Wow. For, you know, the experience and all those things. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. And then, so is that, um, is that like model that's running in the background to help make those assessments? Is it like, um, is it by AI? Is it learning? Or is it how does that operate? All of the above. So, I mean, our data scientist, our head data scientist uh, came from FICA. He also used to be at a, a, a neo bank called Aspiration. Um, he leads our data team um, that leads our score. That score um, is, is a model for sure. It is homegrown and built by us. And it does include um, um, AI and machine learning. Um, it uses some of the open source AI products from Amazon um, to 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 perfect it, but but no, it is definitely proprietary and, and built by us. One of the one of the things that we learn are 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 we that intelligent and bright? I don't know, but we have something that no one else has. And I give you an example: if you take a car loan and you know it's going, it's like sixty months, right? Um, so I don't, I don't have an entire cohort of data on your, because uh, I have to wait 60 months to really know if my model that I created 
when you got the loan worked. Hey, like how much things in your lives have changed in 60 months? Right. We're going through entire cohorts in five to seven days, 14 right. days, right? So what we learn, we're like, wait a minute, our competitive advantage is that we will always collect data more frequent and more real time than anyone else because of the short duration of our loans. Um, so even if our model, quote unquote, our model is broken, even if our model never worked, because we're getting data so fast, eventually it's going to start outpacing everyone else. Because again, I go get a loan in a car loan right now, that they don't know anything about until I, until I start the default, right? We can start, we can just figure things out a lot faster. So that that advantage is really, really competitive. I mean, we, we've gone through an, you know over 35,000 complete cohorts of loans. Um, and in a 30 day time period, we're talking 2,500 to 5,000. So we're, we, we, you know, the, the amount of data and our ability to make assessments and changes are, are, are extremely dynamic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's amazing. You know, it's learning at every one of those, right? It's you're, you're getting to become more and more kind of comprehensive in that view. That's, yeah, that's impressive. Um, one other thing, and I'll ask this question and then I'll turn to some of the questions that are rolling in um, from folks watching. And if you haven't asked a question yet, feel free to throw a question in the comments. Um, but, you know, it, we've talked a little bit in the past, Rodney, about the, there's, there's an education aspect here, too, of, of helping uh, folks understand whether borrowers and lenders, why certain changes are being made, what's going on, and, um, and, and kind of the impact that can have on then behavior and, and really meaningfully changing the way folks are looking at loans and, and their financial behavior. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, so we definitely do have a, a financial literacy component in the app, but I would tell you that the app is designed, so sometimes, it's rare, but sometimes you, you get founders that understand the market so intimately well that the smallest design features are designed based on what they intimately know, right? And what we know about financial literacy is that they're, they're, you can't read it to teach it. You have to create, um, you got to create the behavior and you got to let them continue to do it. Yeah. So this core component of the app where number one, if you default on a loan, you're cut off. It's single elimination. You're out, you're done. The only way to get back in to this revolving credit product is for you to repay your loan. Um, we have let borrowers that will come back after a year or months because they realize, wait a minute, I've 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 become a bad lender borrower. I've defaulted on all my loans. And my credit is bad, and then I I had an option that was going to teach me. I had an option, but then I I so no, I have to pay that back. So then we start becoming what I would call a higher we become a, a from a psychology standpoint we actually become a higher hierarchy of need for them so all of a sudden you have these lenders that historically have been bad with everyone else they're repaying solo loans and i think that single elimination is a core component i think the other core component is that they actually are getting a loan from another individual you can actually see that person in the app like you know that mike is giving it there's something super personal about letting Susie know that Mike gave you the money and that you actually sign a promissory note between Mike and Susie. That personal fact. So when you do not pay, you know, Susie or Mike back, it's, it's, it, you didn't, you're not necessarily hurting solo. I want to be very, very clear. You're hurting that potential lender that may not be there the next time you need capital. So that's another core component. And then the, the other core component is because the loans are short duration, historically, we say, I'm gonna give you a thousand dollar credit line. I'm gonna give you ten thousand dollar credit line. And then we just expect people to be as responsible as they need. What we say is no, no. I'm going to give you five hundred dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars, and you have to pay back in seven days, fourteen days, twenty days, twenty-one days. Now, granted, if you look at that over a year, 
a person may lend, I mean, a person may borrow $10,000, but they borrowed in increments of what they could repay back. Right. So all of a sudden, the psychology is like, I don't borrow what I don't need. I borrow what I can pay back. And that is how you teach people how to manage a budget. You can't be teaching them with Excel spreadsheets and all sorts of things. The, the, the concept of if I need something, I should only ask what I need, and then I pay it back. And then I should ask it again. Versus, I think the historical market, the current credit market, you know, if I go fill out some paperwork now, they're going to give me all this money. I don't need that. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I don't need that. I didn't ask for it. I didn't need it. Yeah. But it's like, what can I get instead of what? <laughs> and, and that's how you get into a debt trap. That's how you get into a credit trap because you start, you get it. So you start to buy things and spend things on things that are not necessarily need. And what we're trying to do, what we're teaching these borrowers is you ask for what you need and you will always have this resource. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, it, when you're talking about it and you're right, that it's that personal connection, it's, you know, there's a bit of that accountability and yeah, it's going to be like that bridge is burned if, if you don't pay it back. I mean, that feels like you're extending the friend and family network is what it feels, you know, it feels closer to that than like your traditional, traditional loans or, or anything like that, right? It's, it's yeah. kind of growing this network of people that you can go to as you need something. Yes. It's yeah. one of the reasons why we, we named it Solo. So it's, we want to empower people. We want to empower people. I want to, we wanted to empower the lender and the borrower independently. So it's about them. Like if I'm lending, I know that Solo's got my back. Solo's gonna get my money back. <laughs> if I'm borrowing, I know that I can, I can manage the, the things that I need, and then someone can help me, but it's based on what I need. It's, it's all about me. And if I mess this up, this, it's all about me. I'm going to be the, 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 the I'm going to get the consequence, right? So, yeah. we, you know, we tried to play with that versus like this whole concept of like a team or group or community. It's actually, we like to flip it on the opposite. It's the complete opposite. It's not about the community only works if we are individually accountable. Yeah, how interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's, um, it's just, it's, it's a very cool model. Um, and I want to be, we have a couple questions that have come in. I want to make sure that I get to ask you, um, someone asked, how do you balance running two companies? Do you ever feel like you just don't have the bandwidth? Well, let me rephrase this. I don't run two companies. <laughs> Um, both companies have their, uh, a listener has a CEO and um, Solo Funds has a CEO. Okay. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a founder. I am the chief commercial officer of Listener and I am a committed advisor to Solo. You know, I think you got to, so can I be a CEO? Yeah, I've done it. I was a CEO of Listener for almost seven years. But I think when, once I started to see that I needed to figure out how more resources could get more of me. And to do that effectively, I needed to give away some things to others. And I needed to focus on what I was good at. So um, I'm, I'm, I am really good at a lot of things, as we talked about it, right? But I'm pretty balanced. And, oh. um, and I, and I, um, and I've done it a couple of times now. So like, I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm an incredible resource if, if, I, if you can get my time. Yeah, absolutely. We certainly appreciate yours today. <laughs> um, and someone said, where are your companies based and why? Was it based off of where you live? Was it more about incentives? Things like that. Hey, if, if there was as many West Virginia startup programs as there are today, you might have never, never seen me leave. Hey, well, we're trying to bring you back. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, and I and that's that's honestly, I mean, when I when I, I moved to Cincinnati to work at PNG, um, I met someone in the startup community. My first, you know, investment came out of that community. That's why we were headquartered in Cincinnati. I was able to that community supported listener. Um, solo at one point, so at some point in time, I had opened up an office in New York, and I was spending a lot more time in New York. And we technically started a company in New York. 
And I would tell you that when we first started the company, New York wasn't necessarily like we didn't have like a startup network in New York. But guess what? Good old Ohio came through. So we got like Solo was actually got into two Ohio accelerators. So we just the company moved to Ohio. And then it got into a Kansas City accelerator. Guess what? Solo went to Kansas City. Right? Um, I would tell you that if any any accelerator that had accepted them in the early days, the company would have moved there. The, the, we don't. I, I think for us, it's really about making sure that we get it going. Right? We want to be successful, and I think I think companies can be successful in, in a number of different regions. The only reason why we made Solo in particular made its way to Los Angeles was we 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 recruited and got a co-founder of a billion dollar company to be our chief product officer. And that was, he was at Tala. Tala is also a micro lender, but in emerging markets. So that was like super special talent. So guess what? I was like, get up, let's go. We're going to Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. So trust me, if somebody wants me to move and, um, and it's gonna cut the check, gotta go. Gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You hear that, West Virginia? <laughs> no, but yeah, no, it is. It's like that flexibility is key, right? Yeah. It, um, yeah, absolutely. And um, there's opportunities. You, you can find opportunities. There's regions, there's economic places, that are, there's, there's cities and companies that want your company there, and you should think about that. Yeah, and, and sometimes, I mean, I think what we're seeing, and, and you totally pointed it out, is it's like, some of us are, are, are new to the table of offering resources to startups and, and realizing how helpful, but sometimes those, those kind of newer programs can actually be, you know, really resourceful for, you know, for a startup. Um, and, and it's interesting that what took you to LA, you know, it sounds like you were in Kansas City, you were in Ohio, you were in these places where the resources could really wrap around you. Um, and then, Special talent got you got you to LA in this case, well, but those are, you get it right. We needed more support mm -hmm. to get ready for the big time. Yeah, <laughs> and that, maybe that's that's what you could say, right? We needed more support to get ready for the big time, but maybe, I, I maybe. Um, okay, a couple more. Uh, someone asked, is does solo work or could it work for unbanked populations? Yeah, so it it doesn't today. So you you definitely are required to to have a bank account. Um, that is really core component. But I would tell you that I think um, about a month ago, we announced a new partnership with Visa. It was kind of like a bit ambiguous. What does this mean? Well, Visa has committed to their their lever they committed to fast tracking us to get you know um, trans transmitter licenses, banking licenses, and et cetera. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is that we will have an option for unbanked. So if you do come to the platform and you are unbanked, um, we will have an option to get you in. Um, it is coming. It is part of the product roadmap. So and it is definitely part of the mission. Amazing. That's awesome. Um, and having, having Visa behind you as you do that is no, no, small, no small thing either. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would say you, can do it. you can do it all. You can do things a lot of different ways, but get, getting the biggest support that you possibly can get makes it easier. Absolutely. And then, um, all right, two more. One, how did you know when it was time to leave PNG? Um, I, I'm a pretty simple guy. Um, and I basically, I think I, I just modeled out, you know, our capital expenses for 12 months and what I would need. And I basically said the first the investor that gives us a hundred thousand dollars, I'm out of here. <laughs> and and I and I was very very clear. I was like, I'm not going to leave PNG without a minimum investment of this. Okay. Right. Um, so you were looking for investors kind of as you're still at PNG and testing the waters a bit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, you should. You yeah. Should. Absolutely. And then you should be very very clear, right? Yeah. Um, I think I think investors appreciate a, a level of transparency. Yeah. Right. If if it's not good enough for you to give me the capital I need for me to leave PNG, then maybe just the idea is not that great. I got I'm doing fantastic at PNG. So like <laughs> don't, don't don't act like you're doing me a favor. I'm doing you a favor. Yeah. 
Totally. No, I love that attitude. <laughs> that's the right, that's the right approach. Um, yeah. That's awesome. And then, um, all right. Do you see ways that solo can help promote economic mobility? It's completely. I mean, that's, that's the, I don't know if that aspect is really important. I, but, and this is just my definition. I mean, economic mobility is two parts. It's a lot of parts. But the most important part to me is access and redistribution of wealth. You, it's very, very important that you redistribute the wealth, right? And I can look at every single company in the United States that's talking about financial literacy, that's offering credit cards, that's giving loans. Who's lending the money? And it's an institution. Find it. I, I, there's no readings. Financial literacy cannot be taught in a book. So let's just get that out of the book, right? I'm talking about if we really want to be create something that's about economic mobility, and it's it's about access to funds, and it's about receiving funds, redistribution of wealth, and who monetizes financial products. It's always big financial companies. The core list, what solo is, is the first time the, 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 the person who's making the majority of the money is the individual lender. It's Mike who lent you the money. You got to understand what we're doing. We, if a bank, the bank is a, a bank convinces people to put deposits and then a bank lends your money out. And that's what, the, that's what a bank does. That's what a bank is. We like our new tagline is actually the community bank redefined or reimagined because instead of taking the capital and lending it out, we're going to say, hey, lenders, we're going to make we're going to allow you to make money off your capital. We're going to allow you to make the money the bank would have made. And that's going to redistribute the capital. And that's how you really become economic mobility. The largest companies in the world are banks. The most liquid companies in the world are banks. When's the last time you were able to invest in the bank? Yeah. I mean, you can, but you get what I'm saying, guys. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, yeah. The, the point is, is like if you really want to be create something that's about economic mobility, you have to start with the capital and how money is lent and borrowed and then you have to make it easier and then you have to redistribute it so when we talk about our product vision or uh, how solo becomes a billion to two to three a ten billion dollar company it's going to more resemble a bank but the individual lenders are going to reap the benefits yeah oh that's super powerful i'm like getting ready. I'm like can i download it like right now and check it out and see everything about it because man it's like it's, it sounds amazing. And just, yeah, the vision for kind of this future, right? This future yeah. of better access and, and kind of a, a different take to community banking is is amazing. Um, yeah. We have our own underwriting rules. We have our own capital source. We are our own bank. Yeah. Why, why, we, can, we, can, we can do a lot of things that a lot of people said that we probably couldn't. <laughs> Wild. Wow. Um, well, it's, you've given us a lot of Cool things to think about and, and chew on. Um, unfortunately, we're running a little low on time, but is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to let people know about or talk about here? Uh, no, listen, if you're, if you're in need, if you're, if you're it's, it's rough times, you know, you're a startup founder and you made the jump and you made the jump <laughs> early, go to Solo. We'll be there for you. If you're a lender, if you're someone that has a little bit extra, you're doing pretty well, you know, take that hundred dollars and lend to someone, and start off with a hundred bucks. Then in a week, do two hundred bucks, and keep it going. But that's it. Cool, cool, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Rodney. And I know we'll all be keeping a close eye on all the all the stuff you're doing. Awesome. Thank you for uh, having me, and it was a pleasure. Yeah. See you soon.